Welcome to the South Australian True Crime Podcast, dealing with the cases that have been forgotten to time. Adelaide, South Australia's capital, was once wrongly accused of being the murder capital of the world by a misinformed British journalist. It certainly isn't the murder capital, but it does have more than its fair share of strange murders and disappearances. And these are the cases we deal with here at South Australian True Crime.com. All our stories are based on facts and have been thoroughly researched. Please be aware that this podcast is not recommended for people under the age of 14, as it may contain details or murders, sexual assault, or other violent crimes. If this podcast raises any issues in Australia, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. All these episodes are available on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and in text at the South Australian True Crime blog at southaustraliantruecrime.com. Please like, subscribe, leave a rating or a comment. Today's sponsors are Osties, the Australian T-shirt printer, and Smoky Blues Guitars. Contact details for these businesses can be found in the show notes of this episode. Now, strap yourselves in for another South Australian true crime story. This is the story of a Finks MCC associate, who was a boxing state title holder, who was gunned down in the street, twice. Bora Altintas was one of those who found crime, everywhere he went. Born in Turkey on the 20th of October 1967, a young brother to Laura. Bora, Laura and their parents moved to Australia, and that's when the crimes of Bora began. He had been in constant trouble with the law since he was a young child. Dragged before the children's court on numerous occasions, but all threats of being locked up and any punishments handed out proved fruitless. As an adult, his early rap sheet included escape from custody, willful damage, resisting arrest, unlawful possession, shop breaking and larceny, and possessing Indian hemp. His first prison term began in 1986, when the then 19-year-old Bora and two friends broke into a bookmaker shop, waited for the owner to return and threatened the owner with a baseball bat and a toy pistol, making off with more than $13,000. The bookmaker recognized the young men, and it wasn't long before the courts charged Bora with armed robbery. The court case was in November 1986. Bora received a sentence of two years and six months imprisonment, with a non-parole period of 12 months. He served 12 months before being released on parole. The next major crime added to his rap sheet was in March 1989, for selling 191 grams of heroin in three separate deals. While in prison on remand awaiting his court trial, he assaulted two correctional officers. When he did make it to court, he received an additional five years for each count of heroin dealing, added on top of the remainder of his armed robbery charges. A further seven months added for the assault on the guards. The final judgment and sentence. 11 years and 4 months incarceration, with a non-parole period of 8 years. Later reduced to 5 years on appeal, taken from the time of the original crime of armed robbery, back in 1986. On his release in 1992, he took up professional boxing, backed by the Finks MCC. His fighting career only lasted two and a half years, but he certainly made his mark. His first professional fight, on the 26th of April 1992, was held at the Old Lion Hotel against New Zealander, 
Moses Ulai. This fight was also Moses's first professional fight, which Bora won via a technical knockout in the third round. Of Moses's seven professional fights, he only won two and then vanished from the boxing scene. Bora's second fight was at the Morfordville Racecourse, with the opponent being a man named Miles Plant. Unfortunately for Miles, Bora knocked him out cold in the first round. Fight number three was held in Victoria's Mechanics Hall in Frankston against Alex Kiss. Once again, Bora knocked his opponent out in the first round. The fourth fight was against a man by the name of Mark Picker at the Morfittville Racecourse. This time Bora lost by the judge's decision. This infuriated Bora, and he promised revenge on Mark Picker. The next fight was against Ricky Jackson, again at Morfittville, and another TKO dealt out by Bora in the second round. Fight 6 was a major event in the boxing world at the Memorial Drive Tennis Center. The main fight at this event was Lester Ellis vs. Rocky Berg. Bora's fight was a support act against the boxer. He had promised revenge against Mark Picker. Bora and Picker's fight started pretty even with blows being dealt and received by both fighters. When the bell went at the end of the second round, Picker dropped his hands and a full three seconds after the bell. Bora right hooked Picker, dropping him. Bora received a disqualification by referee Tom Ferrautos for a punch after the bell. This decision sent Bora into a rage. Back in the changing rooms, Bora punched out the guy who was next to fight, breaking his cheekbone. So that fighter had to forfeit his match. It was a bit of an all-in fight for a while until security calmed it all down. Out of his next seven professional fights, Bora had one KO, one TKO, four awarded on points, and one unanimous decision. So, Bora only lost two fights in his whole boxing career, both of them to the same guy. After his last boxing match in 1994, five days before Christmas, Bora was sitting in his car in a quiet suburban street not far from his house. There were suspicions that he was waiting for a drug mule to drop off a shipment. Another car pulled up next to his, and a double-barrel sawn-off shotgun was pointed out the window at Bora. Bora managed to throw himself down on the front seat of his car, preventing the shot from hitting him in the head when both barrels were fired directly at him. Bora managed to drive himself to hospital. Over 100 buckshot pieces were pulled out of his body, but the doctors could not guarantee that they got all of them. When questioned by the police, Bora claimed he did not see the shooter's face and could not remember what type of car the shooters used. Bora soon recovered from this shooting, but never professionally boxed again. He moved to Melbourne for a while, living in a Church Street house in Richmond, that was owned by a member of the Finks. While he was there, he hooked up with a drug dealer by the name of Trey and Juma. Juma supplied Bora with four ounces of heroin, one ounce Bora paid for. The other three ounces were on credit. The only problem was that the Victorian police, in partnership with the New South Wales police, 
and the South Australian Drug Task Force had been tracking Dumas. They even managed to get listening devices into his car. At 9pm on the 18th of November, 1997, Victorian police raided the Church Street Richmond safe house and arrested Bora. Two days later, on the 20th of November, Bora was extradited back to South Australia. He was held in custody for just over three months before being released on bail. One of the conditions of his bail was that he wore a tracking bracelet on his ankle. Over the next few months, he was spotted at the Adelaide Casino and also at the Royal Hotel at Henley Beach without his tracker bracelet around his ankle. On the 18th of September, he was seen at a Henley Beach card club, once again without his tracker around his ankle. On the same day, he was seen on the other side of Henley Beach Road, directly opposite the card club. The person who reported the sighting said that he seemed to be in a heated argument with two members of the Fink's Motorcycle Club. Monday, the 21st of September, 1998, at around 11 p.m., Bora received a phone call at his Mile End home. He got a friend to give him a lift to the Apollo 11 Club at 87 Torrens Road, Brompton. When they arrived, Bora got out of the car and walked up to the public phone box on the footpath in front of what was then a Foodland supermarket. At the time of writing this, the supermarket is branded as a food works store. He made a phone call then walked back to the car, told the driver to disappear and to come back in half an hour. As the driver left, he thought he saw another car pull up and two men get out. Four shots rang out. Bora's driver checked his rear vision mirror in time to see one man running back to the car and the car speeding off. The driver turned his car around and returned to where he found Bora dead on the footpath with four high-powered bullets in him. One of the bullets passed right through him and through the phone box. By the time ambulance arrived, Bora was pronounced dead, aged just 30 years old. The bullet hole remained in that phone box until around 2010. I personally have been in that phone box and seen the bullet hole. Bora's sister, Laura, is featured in episode 10 of this podcast in an episode named Warlord Bikey Thrown Overboard Alive. A couple of weeks after Bora was killed, Laura was walking down the footpath less than one kilometre from where Bora was killed when someone drove past and fired a handgun at Laura, hitting her in the arm. It did no major damage but Laura took this as a warning. At the time of the writing of this episode, almost 25 years after the event, no one has been charged for Bora Altintas's murder. There was a couple of suspects that police looked into thoroughly, but those suspects were later discounted. There is a $200,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Thank you for listening to this South Australian true crime podcast. Please remember to subscribe, like, leave a rating or comment. Show notes and links can be found on the South Australian True Crime Podcast website at southaustraliantruecrime.com. And don't forget to tell your friends about us. There will be more stories posted real soon. And until then, remember, don't get murdered.